So welcome to uh, Andy Kirkpatrick's first podcast. Uh, I'm Andy Kirkpatrick and I'm currently in a, uh, an unidentified uh, Arab country and I'm walking to work. Uh, the reason I'm in a, an unidentified Arab country is where I live is a uh, very strict um, you can uh, be uh, deported for for almost anything. You can be uh, you can go to prison for bouncing a check or having a girlfriend. You can uh, yeah. So it's uh, anyway. So it's unidentified. So I'm on my way to to work. I work as a as a writer. So going to work is going to sit in some kind of coffee shop or anywhere where you can sort of lurk. I can't work, I don't work very well at home in like a quiet space. I think I have like attention deficit syndrome. So like if you have a, if you have a kid who uh, like Ritalin and things, it's like a stimulant, I'm told. So you, if someone's kind of hyperactive, if the brain's hyperactive, if you stimulate them, then it calms them down which uh, doesn't really make much sense to me, but and that must be why I like working in kind of busy, busy places. Uh, luckily, in, if you live in the, the Arab world, the, the, there's a mosque, like every, there must be a mosque every, you know, what I think, like there's always a rat, there's always a rat like 10 feet from anybody or something. So here there's always a mosque, I'm not saying a mosque is like a rat, there, there's always a mosque probably within 500 meters of anywhere uh, when you live in sort of a, an Arab uh, Arab city, Muslim city. So, so yeah, so the mosque generally wakes me up at about half past four in the morning where it, you're supposed to get up and do your, do your thing. I don't, know if, I don't know if people really do. I've got quite a lot of friends who are Muslims and they tell me that they do get up and pray, but I, I find it, I kind of find it hard to believe, but anyway, it just kind of wakes you up and you sort of got that kind of half awake sort of state. Then the alarm goes off at half past five, so it's not it's not like super, not like get a big lion. Get up at half past five, I don't really have breakfast. Uh, and then I um, make my wife for breakfast and then I uh, get out of the house by about half six, seven o'clock. And everything, it's so hot here. It's not hot at the moment. It's, it was like 50 degrees when I got here about four months ago. So, so most people seem to get up early and get on with the day. And most people, like when you, when you first, when we first got here, it was like a ghost town. You never really saw anybody apart from in the evening. Like if you went down to the to the sea, you would see like whole families out. Like it was like you know, like down at the seaside, but it would be 10, 11 o'clock at night. That was the only time you could really start moving around. But it was just uh, hellish. It was like being in a science fiction film. Like what's that film? Um, uh, pitch, pitch. Uh, thing you, thing you. Anyway, that film with Vin Diesel. I think it's called, uh, they have that, go on that planet called, so I'm just trying to climb, cross the road. They go to that planet called cre Crematoria. <laughs> it was a little bit like that. But it's kind of, it's kind of uh, cool. It's like having a, do you know when you have, if you're really into really spicy food, it's like, it's like being in a really spicy country. Like you, it's actually exhilarating or exciting to walk somewhere when it's 50 degrees. And I think the first day, the first day we got here, uh, Vanessa actually uh, cried because it was just so goddamn awful. Um, the place we we live is a total shithole, and the the area we live is a shithole as well. We live in an area where it's primarily uh, like uh, Bangladeshi, Indian, um, like sort of non-native population, and I think in in most of these Arab countries probably less so in like Egypt and places, but 
you know, you're, you're, the, the native population are like 20, 30 percent of the population. So it's, uh, it's, it's, you know, you, a lot of these countries have a lot of money, but it's an you know, like, amazing amount of squalor and, you know, it's like some people are making, you know, huge amounts of money and other people are making like almost nothing. So you know, it's very, it's very, it puts, um, you know, it, it puts all these, uh, people talk about privilege and, and, uh, and all that kind of stuff back in, back in Europe and it's, it's good, it puts it in, puts all that stuff into perspective which is the perspective that it's all bollocks so I'll, I'll, I'll probably talk more about living out here another time but I, I, I seeing this is my first podcast I I didn't really I don't really want to I'll probably talk about climbing sometimes but probably I'll probably just interview uh, some other people have like conversations with some good climbers like that's if 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 this whole podcasting thing wax this might just be terrible but i've put it i've put it off for a long a long time like i always like to think i'm i'm quite sort of good at spotting trends and being on twitter and all that kind of things you know like for everybody else but for some reason the po- podcasting i've kind of put it off because it's i don't know why but i just, I just have like my kids have been telling me to should start doing podcasts for forever um mainly because I keep saying I say am um, a lot because I'm not it's not written down I've not I've got no um I've got no script so if you don't have a script you tend to say am um, a lot so I do apologize I'm I am I'm trying I need to sort of hold a like a something really sharp in my hand and every time I say am um, I'll just squeeze it I'll get, I'll get one of those shock collars Maybe we should bring out a shock, maybe we'll do it on a Kickstarter, shock collar for public speaking. Every time you say, um, or, uh, uh, which is that's probably the same thing, that you get a little, little electric shock, which would be quite good. So, well, on the subject of public speaking, I uh, thought, 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 thought I'd start with, I, I thought, like, maybe talking sometimes about non-climbing related things, but things about, like, the reason... I have a very unusual life. Like not most, most people don't go to Starbucks every day to work, unless you work in Starbucks. I don't, the reason, the reason I go to Starbucks every day, I do go to other places. I go to Costa's, I go to, I tend not to go to like places which are either too small because you tend to sit there all day long or, um, you know, because you can sit in Starbucks all day long. No one really cares. Uh, I do often say though, you, if you're going to make a living as a writer and you're going to spend a lot of time in coffee shops, you're probably better just working in a coffee shop because, you know, you don't make, it's kind of a lifestyle choice being a writer. Like I'm, a, I'm actually quite a successful writer and in terms of, in terms of writing for you know, like a niche audience, I probably do make enough money to say that's my, you know, that's my job. But it's probably only because I work, only because I, you know, I don't really spend any money and I live a very frugal, frugal life. I live in a country where you don't pay any tax, which also, because when you, I think if you, when you live in, I was last, last, last place I was living, I was living in Ireland and Ireland's actually got some good advantages if you're if you can if you can be categorized as a as an artist then you don't pay any tax under like 50,000 euros which sounds which sounds uh you know people might get upset about that but most artists are are making like 12,000 euros so if you're a bono you probably have all your money somewhere else anyway so it doesn't really matter um but later the 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 economies of of being a creative person, are, they're they're pretty they're pretty tough. So, if you're like most people are spending about fifty percent of their income through various taxes, so if you're only making, you know, like I probably make on average about twelve thousand euros a year uh, as a writer. Because I don't really, I could make a lot more than that if I could be asked to 
write for magazines and things. I probably make the same amount of money as a writer as I made 20 years ago when I was writing for magazines and, you know, selling, I used to sell words to sort of Patagonia or Black Diamond and people and you'd be, you'd be getting like a dollar a word. Uh, most magazines you were getting like a, a penny a word. So I used to write gear columns uh, for High Magazine and yeah, yeah, so I probably make, I probably made a pretty good living as a writer, you know, as an old, an old fashioned kind of uh, jobbing writer. But the, but those things have kind of changed now. And af after a while, you know, after, after a while, you just can't be asked doing it really. It's kind of, I, I really enjoy writing blogs and things because you've got, you can just write what you want and you have no limit. There's no like editor or, which is, which is a good thing and a bad thing because some of it's just that terrible. But you can just, you just kind of riff, can I say the word riff? And you just kind of riff on, you have like an idea. And that's probably, the, that's probably, as it Steve Jobs said, you have to, the, 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 the big thing in business is it's not what you do, it's what you don't do. So if you have your own blog, you can write what you want. You can write, you know, you can go off on like really small kind of tangents. And at the moment I'm trying to finish a book and that's, that's, that's kind of it's hard because you have to really knuckle down and finish, finish a book. And you'd just rather write your own musings about various things. Like every day you probably have a little idea little idea about something you'd like to write and it's quite nice when you have the, the the time when you've got the money in the bank then it's it's nice to just write what you want to write it doesn't really matter if everybody reads it but it's just kind of there but I thought today I was going to talk about sort of public speaking because that is probably the primary my primary like form of income and that kind of it that that really is what subsidizes writing for me. So if, if anyone doesn't know who I am, I'm a basically a uh, climber, part-time climber, uh, full-time dreamer. Um, I'm a climber, a writer, and I have like a reputation as like one of the, I'll, I'll say it, I'll be, I won't be humble. Um, I'm, like I did, a, I did a slideshow in Finland last week and said it was the best best slideshow they'd ever had at the festival. So I'm kind of known as being a, a raconteur. I can get on stage and talk about things in, a, in an interesting, funny uh, way. But yeah, I should own it because I've been doing it a long time. So if I, was, if I was still shit at it, then I really it wouldn't be doing it anymore. So a lot of something will do. So, so I thought I'd, I'd talk a little bit <coughs> about my life as a as a speaker, stand-up comedian, motivational person, <laughs> thought leader, <laughs> uh, Tony Robbins. No, uh, I'm not. So I just thought I'd talk about that because it's kind of it's kind of interesting. Because I'm always, I'm always really interested in like when I meet people, I'm always asking them what they do. I, I'm kind of a little I'm a little bit obsessed about asking people what, what people do. It's just really fascinating, like how do people make a living? And in the, in the it's a very kind of English thing, is that people never ask, you know, how do you make a living doing that? How much money do you make? Like I went to I did a slideshow in in Hungary, you know, and everyone is like totally open, like how much money do you make? How much how much money do you get from this book? And and how much do you charge for this lecture? And but people were really so sort of direct, um, but most. Most geniuses have come from Hungary in the 20th century. So, was well, that you don't have to be you don't have to be a Hungarian to be a genius, but it helps or something. Anyway, so I think it's I think it's really good to talk about to, to people's expectations of how much money you're going to make doing something because often people look from the outside at, at people having like what lives that look like really really amazing but you often don't really realize how impoverished they are or the sacrifices that people make to have those kind of lives like most comedians you know most um comedians who are on the television are 
you know, a really, you know, quite, you know, pretty, pretty skin. You know, everyone's like working towards that, the big break. But for every, everyone who makes the makes it, there's like, you know, nine nine hundred ninety nine who who didn't. So I remember what's it? I remember something on Radio Four. It was the singer from Stereo Lab, which was like a band. Really, it was quite a cool band. A band used to like, you know, in like the nineties. And it was saying how, you know, you're in, in your head you're imagining this woman is off somewhere like touring still, you know, doing music soundtracks or whatever. But in fact, she was getting a job on the Eurostar, <laughs> so just working on the Eurostar, which was really, you know, you had this different, completely different pressure. Basically, music just didn't pay the bills, so she just had to get a a proper job, which is pretty, which must be really terrible. Like I know friends who are actors who have just spent their whole lives just waiting f to get that role in, you know, Game of Thrones or something. But again, it's uh, anyway, so a, a much more practical, the, the, some of these podcasts are much more practical looks, looking at how you make a living, an unconventional living, which for me, I think, like an unconventional living is basically how most people will be making a living. Um, like I'm basically a, a hustler. That's what I do for a living. I just hustle. And if you go to, you know, go to Africa, you'll you'll find that most people um, are hustling. And I think that's the way the, way the world is hustling. The, the kind of European model of uh, it's good if you can work in the public service. Uh, but most people can't, so most people, you know, uh, increasingly have to do lots of different things. So, so my life as a as a motivational speaker is, I, 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 it's just, it's a strange thing to become because I, I I think back to my older to my young self as being quite shy. You know, one of these kids who didn't like. You know, I didn't even like going to the shops, asking for some sweets or whatever. So I, 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 I feel like I have this impression that I'm, I was very shy. But a lot of these impressions we have of ourselves, completely wrong. Um, my mum would tell me that I was like a real extrovert and I had loads of friends and I was always like the leader of the gang and all this. So, so we, 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 I think it's a thing we, ha we have to be really, really wary of, is the stories we tell about ourselves are generally, you know, just, just, just shite. So, so, it, so, so I had this impression of being quite, kind of shy. Like I was, I would say I was like, they would, say, they would call me um, uh, suboptimal at school. I would say I was a retard, but I, would, I was really not, not good at school. They didn't have any debating societies. Uh, they probably had like masturbating societies, but didn't have any debating societies or any, or anything like that at the school I went to and if you kind of go through school just feeling like you're a total idiot you know really really stupid the, your 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 self-worth maybe it maybe I was maybe I was more confident when I was younger but like how school school has can have a great effect on people in a negative way of making them feel but pretty worthless so so, well, luckily for me, one of the first jobs I had, I got a job in a, in a shop. Uh, I moved to London and got a job in a place called, a shop called Survival Aids in Euston Station, which was a sort of outdoor, outdoor shop, sold stuff like the military and survival people. Sort of, I was, I was like pre-Bear Grylls. It was more like Lofty Wiseman. I could probably tell it, do a whole podcast about working for survival aids, and I'll make one day. But so I was working in this shop, and you know, you, you, you're quite a, uh, you, see, you see yourself as quite a timid person. I didn't like ringing people up, whatever. And the very first day, you know, the manager is like, "Oh, can you ring this customer up?" And like, ha, ha. and 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 to not to to want to not want to be humiliated is a is a really good tonic for many things. So, so you just have to ring this person up, this complete stranger, and talk to them. And 
and having to deal with having to speak to customers was that was you know you just had to do it and uh, and slowly you kind of learn the art of being a salesman and now everyone everyone is a salesman or a salesperson I call it a salesman I'm from I was born in the 1970s I can't I can't change every, everything in my head to fit the 21st century so because being a salesman is you know you're, you're either selling yourself or you're selling a product or you're selling an idea or you're selling you know you want you want to you want to sleep with someone you want to you know you want someone to employ you you want to marry someone you want to all, all these things so you're you're always like selling something so i think a foundation in retail is a really really great great thing and a lot of people a lot of people i meet who uh very kind of good at communicating as in you say oh that, that, this this person is a you know is like a solid kind of person and that you can you know that you interact with them really really well often they they worked in shops when they were like teenagers or whatever so that kind of found you know when you when you meet when you meet people who were you know like um, a professor of mathematics they generally didn't work in uh, prime art and you can sort of tell really so yeah so a foundation in selling is a, is, a, is a good thing because when you when you're selling yourself you or selling something else a lot of it is about well it's basically about communication but it's about sort of like you're kind of flirting with somebody in a way like you don't you don't want to be like the you know like if, if you know someone's selling you something you're just naturally resistant to it so often in retail the classic thing is someone comes in and you say do you want any help and like, people automatically say no because no one you know most people don't even if they want help they'll say they don't want help so that's that's a negative straight away so you just you have to you just have to wear it went a different way like you just have to say i'm just over here if you want anything just give me a shout so that's so much because then they say okay which is a positive so that's a this is a kind of very basic kind of salesman technique so but their, their expectation is that you the person selling is a person who wants to sell them the most expensive thing you're just basically you're just there to basically rob them and, and sell them something you know sell them something they don't really want so you have to sort of subvert that and you know you tell someone you don't want to buy this um it's not suitable or this thing here which is cheaper is is actually better and this is what i use like that's one of the most important thing this is what i have and you think well this guy works here he he can look at this shit all day long like if he if he has it it must be good and i think one of the fa one of the best car salesmen ever he used to say that he wasn't selling he wasn't selling them this car he was selling them the next car which is a really good way of really good way of looking at it really so 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 working in retail was was interesting and you realized that you had to be you had to be um funny you had to pass on information you had to keep people's attention you had to read their body language so so all these things that came in came into play later on like when you're standing on in front of like 2000 people like talking about your holidays i also was lucky in that my mum is a good sort of storyteller and she would always put on these like stupid voices and you have all this um you know she instead of saying like oh this person said oh you can't you can't do that so it's uh you know like you're you're, to, you're too poor she'd be like and then she said oh you can't do this so you're too poor you would like put all these like stupid voice on for all different characters and you you, you I, I i can see my kids do the same because i do it um so we're telling a story was was uh that was you know that was that was kind of handy but also because when I, my, my dad was in the mat rescue rf mat rescue was in the in the air force and i think the people in the military i think they, have, they must have a lot of time on their hands because he's spent a lot of time sitting around they're a bit like roadies basically like militarized roadies in that they're actually very interesting people because they spend a lot of time sitting around reading books uh, very well read like soldiers um 
and so they're good at telling stories. You know, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a real educational aspect of storytelling. Because a lot of people in, in the military, like if they were, you know, Harvard, you know, quality, uh, Oxford, Cambridge, quality, stu- you know, potential students, then they probably won't be in the military. So the, the way of learning is uh, very, very much, I'm, the, I'm exactly the same, like I can, read, I can read a book, I can read like, you know, chapters of a book and none of it goes into my brain until the, the subject matter is tied into a story and I can, I'll remember that forever. So, so yeah, so you'd be, you know, often you'd be sitting around and there'd be these, some guys like telling a story about some incident and you, and through listening to them, you sort of learnt about like timing and you know having a having an end uh, an end point and I remember just being a kid trying to often trying to join in with these conversations and trying to tell a story and like halfway through you realized that it was kind of, you know you were just you were you were hiding to nothing like you didn't really have a point and it wasn't funny and it wasn't even in- interesting so yeah I can, I can I can almost remember the moment when I had that realization like to tell a story is actually a skill it's not just don't take it for granted that anyone can tell a story you have to have a, you have to have a story to begin with uh, and if you're good you can you can turn it's a bit like being a writer like if you're a good writer you can write about a zip you know you can write a whole story about someone's zip breaking on the trousers and you can make it into a great story where other people they can have, you know, they can go land on the moon. And they can make it boring. So, so it's a it's a skill basically. So, so, so all these things were kind of foundations of a uh, of, 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 of a future life. Talking about yourself. So I was I was I was working in a, another outdoor shop. Basically, just worked in outdoor shops. I was working in an outdoor shop. So remember, like I didn't I didn't go to. I didn't go to university, didn't have any qualifications. You know, I was on, I was on the dole until I was like about 19. So I, I, didn't have a lot, I didn't have a lot going for me. So I was working in this, this outdoor shop called Outside and I'd been to the Alps and I'd done my first Alpine route, which was a winter ascent of a route called the Friend of Spare, which was completely changed my life, absolutely changed my life, this, uh, this climb. It led to me re- uh, becoming a writer. Led, led led to all sorts of things. It was a complete epic, and that like my climbing partner never climbed again afterwards. But I there was an ice climbing festival, and this shop was in a place called the Peak District, which is it has no peaks. It's like a joke. It's like a British kind of humour. Let's call this place with no peaks the Peak District. I think it's a way of like getting foreign tourists to go there. Um, so it's, you're doing an ice climbing festival, there's no ice. I don't think there's ever been any ice, there's maybe a bit of ice on the road somewhere. So we had this ice climbing festival and my boss was like, uh, do you want to go and do, um, do you want to go and do, uh, do you want to do a, sli- a, a slideshow at this ice climbing festival about your, about climbing on, um, climb the friend of Bear? And I was like, yeah, yeah, I'll do that. I don't, I don't know why I said that would, but I said, oh yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. And I guess by then I'd been working in the, in the shop for a few years. So I was kind of confident speaking to, speaking to people. So I got my slides together. This was the days of like slides, carousels, or, you know, physical slides, analog slides, would you call them? And I think the other, the other speakers was, there was Andy Cave who wrote Learning to Breathe, which is a, a great book. And uh, maybe Chris Watts was there, maybe a guy called Rob Anderson, they were doing slideshows. And then I just had to do, I was like a, a warm-up man. And I had, to, I had to do like 20 minutes of it. So I put my slide thing on there. I didn't really feel any fear whatsoever. And I put the slide on the, on the slide machine, um, walked, up in front of the, walked up into the front of the room. There's probably about 40, 50 people there. And it was like amazing. It was, it was almost like it wasn't me. It was like, you know, like the Manchurian candidate. It was like somebody else suddenly took over my body and I just started like talking and I was like talking and it was 
funny and people were laughing and I was like just saying what came into my head and it just seemed to be funny and I, maybe I maybe I told these stories already like in the shop I like talked to customers probably bored them to, to death talking about it because this climb was so intense it's such an intense experience that I, I probably thought about it like every five minutes for about a year afterwards so anyways I just talked for 20 minutes and it was like it was like an amazing experience. It was a bit, a little bit like you know when you're a kid, and you go to the, you go to a disco, and you know you, you don't, you don't dance, and then, and then you start dancing, and then it's like the most amazing thing to be dancing at a disco, and after that you just want to go dancing the whole time. It was a little bit like that. It was really, like, wow, this is amazing. I got to do this again. So after that, I like took every opportunity I could to just stand up and talk about my adventures so I was talking about you know I, start, I went to Patagonia on my first kind of trip I went to try and climb like Fitzroy in winter and went to Yosemite climbed the shield some various routes on El Cap so I had like more and more stories to tell so it was like I was like link it was a bit like being a DJ like when I li- when I lived in I grew up in Hull and I knew a lot of uh, before I left knew a lot of like people are DJing and you could see how people would like link all their link all their uh, music together so it had like a you know it wasn't just like record 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 it was like uh, it, you know it actually was going somewhere so i um yes yeah, so i had all these stories i could like i could start talking about oh in the last year i went to patagonia and i went to yosemite and i went to a trip to the alps and then you had this kind of this like linear kind of uh, storytelling and, and you just like knock one off and add another one on as you were as you're going along and s- slowly you started getting like climbing clubs were like oh will you come and do a slideshow for us about your latest trip and by now i was like w- writing for magazines and things and people kind of knew who it was so this is this is before social media so i don't know how we ever how i ever made a living without social media but uh, somehow i did so i did this uh so, so slowly you, you you you're you're going from talking to, you know in the backs of pubs to people to doing um you know you're, you're talking to more and more people and there's like an organized event and then you're going to climbing festivals and and eventually after you know after several years of this like 10 years of this you now you're, you're there on the stage at, um the bam film festival you know it's saturday night 2000 people you've kind of apart from like appearing at ted or something um, you know, you've really kind of made it as a, as a speaker. And w- one thing I, one of the most important lessons I learned from watching other people was not to make the audience feel uncomfortable on your behalf. So uh, I saw a few slideshows by a guy called Jim Curran, who's uh, who's dead now, but he was a real, a real great like raconteur. Like one of the most famous. It's not his, not his story, but he he went on a trip to the to Trango Tower and he lost so much weight that um, Mo Antoine said to him like, oh, Jim, you're, a, you're the self of your former shadow. Um, is that right? You're the shadow, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, a, a, great, a really good speaker, but every time you saw him speak, something would get fucked up, like his slide machine would stop working or something would happen. And he just took it really badly and it was very, you know, he could, it was really, it was really uncomfortable. And what you realize is that there's a lot of, there's a huge amount of goodwill when you're speaking in front of an audience. And if you, like if you're, if you're a professional, then probably not, but you know, you're an amateur, you're a climber, you're not meant to be a great public speaker. So people have a lot of goodwill and people will laugh about, people that are on your side, they'll, you know, they want to enjoy themselves. They're, they're not sitting there, unless you're in Aberdeen, but like, uh, Dundee, I mean, they're, they're, um, you know, p- people want to enjoy themselves. They're all, they're, you know, so you can say things which aren't even very funny and people will laugh, but they're just desperate to, in, to enjoy it. But they won't enjoy it if, you, if you're having a massive meltdown and you're being like, just taking it badly when something's not, not going, going well. So, uh, so that was it. That was a, so I learned that from Jim, Jim Curran. So I had a few disasters early on and it was how you so a good example of this was i i was 
I had to do a talk in Shrewsbury, so I had to drive like two and a half hours to get there. And I'm, I was always a little bit late, like being early, being on time is being early, basically, that's my motto now. But I, uh, I, grabbed, I grabbed my gear, threw it in the car, my slides and everything, uh, drove to, the, to Shrewsbury, which was two and a half hours away. And when I got there, um, the audience were already there, there's like 160 people all sitting there waiting for me to do my thing. And I, uh, the steward who, who organised the lecture, he was sitting there at the table with all the, you know, getting the, giving the tickets out to people. And I went to get my ba I went to get my slide projector, my slide carousel out of my bag, and all that was in there was my gym stuff. And I was like, oh Christ! I was like, I was like, but I tried to look like it wasn't a big deal. And I was like, oh Stuart, I've got a bit of a problem. He's like, what? I said like, I forgot to bring my slides. And Stuart, he just like put his head down onto this table, and I'm like, but don't worry about it, Stuart. Like, have you got any slides? And he's like, what? I said, have you got any slides? He said, yeah, yeah. I said, well, you can get your slides and I'll do my slideshow using your slides. So <laughs> he, he looked very uh, confused. But I was like looking like it wasn't a big deal. So, he, you know, so that's very important to, to sort of bluff that you're not really shitting yourself. So, so anyway, so he went off. So I went to the thing and uh, I realized I, I'm gonna have to do something. So, cause he, was, he, was, he probably lived away away. Away. So I ran to my car and in my car, in the, in the olden days of analog, you had um, slide film and you had to cut it up and put it into slide mounts. And I didn't have any slides. I did have some, some like ends of slides like in the boot, which had just been left to like some litter, which was just black with a tiny little bit of color that had bled into it. So I, I had some slide mounts. So I, I, I got, I had enough for four slides, four black slides. So, so I cut these four black slides out and put them in the mounts and put them in a carousel and went in and I put it on the slide projector and I was like, hi everybody, um, we've got a little bit of a problem this evening and I forgot my slides. And everyone's like, ha ha, they all laughed. And uh, so, that, that, so, so that, you know, I thought, well, that's, that's a start. And I said, but don't worry about it. Stuart's gone home to get his slides and I'm doing my slideshow with his slides. And again, hey, that's so funny. I said, but before that, I'm just gonna use these four slides. I found the back of my car. Uh, they're just black, so don't worry about it. So I just started talking with these four slides and within within like one minute, I'd use all four black slides. So I just started going backwards and forwards. I was like, oh, see this slide here? It's all black. I want you to imagine that this is actually, you know, the, the, the super cool one on Fitzroy or... So, so, so anyway, everyone's enjoying it. And, and it's actually, I probably, I, I owe this, part of this is that I remember Mark Twight saying how just, or someone had said the scene Mark Twight and he did a slideshow without any slides. Just, he just sat on a, on a stool and he just like told the story. And I remember thinking like that is a, that's a, that's a sign of a really good performer. So, so I did this for like half an hour, 40 minutes with no slides. And then Stuart turned up. So I was like, okay, we'll have a break. I'll put Stuart's slides in. So everyone had a little break, they all came back put Stuart slides in, the first slide that comes up, it's a Fontainebleau, like bouldering in Fontainebleau, and I'm talking about climbing in Patagonia in the winter time. So there's a picture of Stuart in his shorts and his, in his like rock boots. I'm like, oh, see this photograph here? Imagine instead of rock boots, he's got plastic boots on and it's like, instead of like a 25 boulder, it's like a 2000 meter high granite face. Um, so it, it went really well. And at the end I said, next year I'm gonna come back and I'll do the slideshow for free and I'll, and I'll bring my slides next time. So. The next year I came back, did the slideshow, and uh, had all the slides, the same people came. And at the end, I'd finished, everyone, everyone clapped at the end. And at the end, this old guy came up and he was put his hand on my hand and he was like, he said, oh, it was much better last year. So, so being able to sort of bluff your way through and not make people feel uncomfortable is a really, really important skill in, 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 in many things. Um, and I've, I've used it the same in like on, on you know, trips, expeditions and things where basically everything's fucked and you just have to make it look like it's not as bad as people think. So probably one of the, the funny of versions of this story is that I did a slideshow in London in a cinema and uh, halfway through I had a really, really poor quality uh, computer and halfway through 
just the screen just went black and it just came up like disk error, you know, closing down, the computer closed down. And everyone was like, because <gasps> everyone's thinking like, oh my God, the poor bastard, like his computer's stopped working. And I was like, don't worry about that. I don't need that. I don't need the slides. So I just kept on talking. So again, so I'd had this experience of not having slides before, so it wasn't, I could deal with it. So anyway, so I'm talking, talking, talking. Then all of a sudden, the computer comes back on again and someone in the audience had actually gone up into the, the projector room and managed to reboot the computer. So the computer came back on and everyone's like, hey! And I was like, oh yeah. So do you know what? There wasn't actually anything wrong with the computer. I, uh, I just said that because I wanted you to all to feel like what it feels like when you're out of control and it's how you deal with these things. That's what really matters. And I was like, fucking hell, that's so clever. Anyway, I pressed the next slide and the computer switched off again. So. So yeah, so 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 so, so, the, so all these things are kind of important skills. Like when I did, when I finally made it to to the BAM Film Festival, you know, amazing. I've made it. This is my this is my big break. You know, BAM for all these people, and I uh, I had this like like I'm not very good at pr preparing these kind of things. So but I did I did prepare, and I had um, I'd done this really really cool bit of music. I had you know, that, that film, like that, that song by Johnny Cash, that kind of one, uh, one love kind of song. Uh, so I had that and I had it with like a montage of like images. It was going to finish my slideshow and it was like so good and everyone's going to be crying. Oh yeah, this is going to be perf you know, perfect. Like I'm going, to I'm going to make them laugh. I'm going to make them cry and all that kind of stuff. So I get to the end and almost the end. So I just want to finish with some music. I had them in the palm of my hand. You know, they're like, God, this guy's amazing. And, uh, and I press play and nothing happened. Basically, what in the slideshow, there was, some, there was a bit about crossing Greenland and, and there was a wind sound, but the wind sound, it, it was somewhat, for some reason, it didn't stop playing. So it just kept playing and playing and playing. So the technician had had to turn all the sound down on the slideshow. So although, the, although Johnny Cash was singing, he was singing behind, in, within a big windstorm. So, so um, anyway, so no sound came up. I'm just standing there, and everyone's like looking, and these slides are coming on. I was like, fuck, fuck, what am I going to do? I just have to start singing. So I started singing, and I was like, oh, here's a person here in the cold. Oh, he looks like he's having a bad time. Oh, da 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 da. And I just started like, oh, here's a mountain. That's a. And, and I just started having to sing for like, two and a half minutes while this, these slides were showing and everyone was like in hysterics and they were laughing anyway and afterwards they were like oh god that was hilarious like god how do you think you're doing something like that and I was like I didn't I just it just didn't work I just had to improvise and like oh no no that was definitely you know that was all planned so uh, so yes yeah, so don't, maybe don't be you know don't be afraid of uh, fuck ups so on, on that on that front I so, so I was I was doing all these festivals and things and then and every year I'd try and tour around and I would try and make try and make a living like talking to like universities and you know climbing groups and stuff but it I, rem I remember did like a tour and it was just a little mini tour and it was just terrible like no one came like I realized that climbers were fucking the worst people you could ever try and make any money out of because they just were unreliable they wouldn't turn up you know they were just oh I went climbing instead and you know, then they'd be, be, be bitching and moaning that you charged them any money whatsoever. They'd try to get in for free. And it was just like a waste of time. So, but I'd done a, I'd done a slideshow. Like I'd done, I'd done quite a lot of slideshows for like mountain rescue teams or, you know, like charities and things. And what you realize was often they just take the piss and they wouldn't put any preparation in to getting anyone to come because you were free. So it doesn't really matter if no one turns up, but, but you're not free to you. You know, you're, you're having to drive for five hours to stand in front in a room when no one's there. So, so the books in my rescue team had asked me to do a, a slideshow to raise some money. And I was like, I'll do it, but I'll only do it if we can get the Buxton Opera House and I'll get Ian Parnell, who's a, you know, a really good climber at the time, a really good climber. And we're, you know, we'll, we'll go like 50-50, like me and Ian will get 25% and you get 50%, but like we could get like 2000 people. They have to pay like 15 quid, you know, it's like a night out, you know, and it was really, this is, this is the way we're gonna do it. And I think they ummed and awed, but they, they thought we could pull it off. And, and we did, and we, we got like, you know, a you know, thousand people or whatever. 
all paying loads of money. Like me and Ian made, like uh, it was like really good for us. It was really good for the Matt Rescue team. And people might think maybe that's a bit mercenary, but like that's that's how you make money for people is by doing a, a good job. So. Um, so that made me realise that there was actually an audience out there that weren't like spotty teenagers in a, you know, doing like engineering. So, so I thought like, I had to give this up or I just need to do it, do it better. So I guess that's, that's been probably the way I've kind of looked at most, most of the things I do in my life is, you know, can I do this better? If not, I'll just have to not do it. So. So I decided I had to basically had to get an audience who weren't climbers necessarily. Like climbers could come, but you know, you had to get people who were like, you know, mums and dads and you know, just ordinary people. People who were like interested. Like I'm not interested in airsoft, but I sometimes watch videos about it on YouTube when I'm bored. You know, I don't even I've never even fired an airsoft gun, but it's got, I find it kind of interesting, like listening to people talking about running around in some German forest firing at other people so you know so, so there's, a, there's amazing people you know and out, outdoor a lot of people are interested in you know armchair mountaineers and read all these books and stuff so that's what I'll do so I did I did the first tour and it was like a re really successful you know it was successful as in you know you had like two three hundred people coming and they were paying like 15 quid so the the the, 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 the cut of, of a slideshow is um, the venue gets 30% uh, then you have to give of that 70%, you, you know, you're going to have to give a certain percentage to, you know, your marketing, blah, 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 all, all these things. So, you, so people think, you, you know, you're going to see a, uh, like, you know, a good example was Prince. So Prince, you know, you go and see Prince and the ticket was really expensive and it was, the place was full, but Prince actually didn't make any money because he had, because he had too many overheads. And, and once when I was touring uh, Grease the Musical, uh, it sold out in all the venues I was going to and then they cancelled it because they realised that although they'd sold out they were going to make a loss so they just cancelled the whole thing so the economy of it is you might have to you know people are like oh god look at you you know you you know in the big time now but you you've just had to pay like ten thousand pounds in uh in marketing to do this tour and if it doesn't work you're totally fucked for life so uh, so yes, yeah, so people don't really see those kind of things, the risks you take for this kind of stuff. So but I ended up starting a, bit, uh, a company called Speakers From The Edge and then I started touring uh, other people around, you know, like um, uh, Simon Yates and Mark Bormon and, all, and all, these, all these kind of people. So, uh, so, so then it was interesting because you were, you were seeing how other people did it and, and the mistakes people made and you realised that you were I don't, know, I don't know if expert is the word, but you knew, you kind of knew quite a lot about this business of, of, of adventure, adventure speaking. So when someone says like in Finland, this is like one of the best, you know, presentations we've seen, it's kind of, it's not surprising if you think how many, how long I've been doing it. You know, it should, it should be pretty good by now. Um, but, but, but teaching other people is interesting. You learn a lot, you learn a lot by what they do right, you learn a lot by what they do wrong. You realize that some people, you have to pay them to stand on the stage, and generally they're not that good. And some people, they would pay you to stand on stage, and generally they're, they're good. So I remember like an interesting experience was being asked to go and speak to Chris Bonington about his slideshows and how to, like so this Chris, Chris Bonington wanted me to do this. To talk to, to talk to him about how you uh, how you just you know how to make his slideshows better or you know more contemporary or whatever. So that you know it's a bit like Chris Bonington is you know some Victorian people did this kind of thing, but you know he really is like one of the you know the fathers of this kind of game. And uh, and I remember like we we're sitting in this, this tiny little study of his, like full of books and boxes of slides. Like Chris is like an amazing an amazing person like it's very easy to scoff you know the, the, you know about Chris Bonington because you know he was very successful but he really is like an amazing person like absolutely if you cho we chopped him in half he'd die if we chopped him in half inside the, there is like an absolute real climber in there so so we're doing this so they're going through the slides and I'm like like Chris like in the slideshow you've you're, you're addressing all these things but you never really address all the people who have died 
that basically almost everyone you're talking about has died climbing. And Chris stops for a minute and then he's like, well, when I climbed Everest in like 1980, whenever, I, uh, I did have this feeling when I was on the summit of, um, of these people being, all these friends being with me. And as he said it, he just started crying. And he's there like just me and Chris Bonington and Chris Bonington's crying. And I'm just like, oh God, pull yourself together, man. And, uh, and uh, I, didn't I didn't realize at the time, but Chris is actually very good at crying. Now, I don't know if this is actually a, a technique, but that is re a really good technique. But don't cry all the time, because that's just pathetic. But being able, to, being able to demonstrate a really deep emotion is really, really incredible. I can remember once, what was his slide? It wasn't a slide, it was someone, a, a writer. He was a really good writer. But listening to writers talking about writing can be a bit boring. Um, you can, I just tend to switch off a little bit because it, unless it's actually telling a story, if it's like a more a general, a general thing, I just kind of switch off a bit. And he was talking about going, um, going like skiing with his son or something. And, it, and in this room, everyone's sitting there. He's talking about skiing, skiing with his son, and his son like doing this, like barreling down this steep cliff. And I was kind of half listening. And then he said. And then he said, like a year later, um, my son was like killed in an avalanche. And in that moment, like every single person in that room, they were like 100% listening to what he was saying. And it was like really, really intense. Like when he was talking about his son, because he was on like the, like, I feel like I'm going to cry now just talking about it, but he was like, he was right on the edge of just not being able to speak. And that is like really, really powerful. Like, you know, I'll never, I think it was, uh, was it David, I can't remember now. <laughs> but I'll never forget like him talking about his son. Like his son is like embedded in my brain now forever. So, so emotion is kind of important. So I eventually um, sold, uh, so it speaks from the edge, actually eventually sold my, my, I ended up working with other people and I ended up getting, <laughs> uh, leaving that business. And now speaks from the edge still exists. And it is a lot of really good, uh, a lot of people in the UK will have been to their events and, and that's who I um, still do tours with. It's kind of weird, you, you start a business and then you end up, you know, then, then you're tour, still touring with them, even though you're not part of it. So anyway, so, so an, another aspect of this is, is talking to, to kids. So I really, really, always really, because I was such a, a suboptimal student at school. I'm, I've always been really interested in education. I've got like two kids of my own, full set. And so I you know, started doing talks for, for schools and you know, public schools, private schools, uh, primary schools, colleges, all, all this kind of stuff. And, and that, that's really interesting. That's a really good way of becoming a better speaker because kids have a very, very <laughs> low threshold of boredom. So I think a child's attention span is its age plus two, maybe. Um, you know, you learn lots of good things about you should never really try and engage with the kids because, you know, primary school kids, because they'll all start yabbering along and, you know, they'll all get hyper and, you know, and um, the, the way a child's brain, like I think I have a bit of a child's brain. Like I always say, I, I say a lot of things um, which I shouldn't say. And I think that's kind of a you know, something to do with... I have, I have a part of my brain that is uh, not fully developed, um, which manifests itself as like people might say it's dyslexia or whatever, but there's a part of my brain that isn't, isn't developed. It's, 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 the, it's the part that deals with uh, risk, risk taking and everything else. So it actually makes you a more interesting speaker because you're kind of edgy because I have, I have very, it's very hard for me to control what I'm, um, you know, whatever comes into my brain is probably already out of my mouth before I realise it. So, so, uh, so one of the things I always love with like kids was the when they ask you uh, question and answers, and uh, so I remember once I did a slideshow about uh, Greenland, and one of the kids was like, uh, "How did you breathe if there's no trees?" Which is quite a good question. And then one of the kids was like, uh, did you come back? Which is a very good question. So, and then you'd always get the kids who would ask a question 
that another kid had just asked. And everyone was like, he just asked that question. And uh, so that's always really cool. And then you always have that kind of, um, you always have that the bit where the, the headmistress or whatever comes up and says, well, thank you, Mr. Kirkpatrick, for coming here and speaking to us all today. And, and shall we all give him a nice pick around? And he's, oh, that's all really, that was interesting. Um, because I'm because I have this kind of uh, this dyslexia kind of label attached to me, I'd often end up talking to because I wrote this book, Psycho Vertical, and there's a bit in there about dyslexia. So you often get invited to talk to schools where they have you know they've all these problem children, and I uh, I remember once giving a talk uh, at a college, and they really focus on having lots of dyslexic kids in there, and it was like a it's like a prize day or something, and I was like. Um, Oh, congratulations, kids! You're so lucky. You've been born, born different. You know, whatever. And remember, all the parents were like, "Oh my God, that's not true." My little Timmy, he's di severely disabled. So, I, I one of the the, the I, don't, I don't know if it was a darker side of this kind of thing. Is I, I end up for some reason I end up talking to a lot of like bad kids. Uh, you shouldn't call them bad kids, but they are. They're just little bastards. So, like kids who were, you know, they were just bad. <laughs> No, they weren't bad, but they were just, you know, anyway, they were bad. So they were just kids who were just bad. So, um, so I remember they did a talk in St. Albans, and I think it was quite a rough school. And I don't know why, I, you, know, like, you know, like people often say like, oh, because I'm black, people always profile me as being, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to rob them or shoplift, whatever. I, I think coming from Hull, I have a similar problem. Wherever I go, I often seem to get into trouble. Uh, the police, I, I've, been, I've been stopped by the police a lot. I was like in a university uh, recently and I was like st stopped by the security and asked what I was doing there. I was actually there to have like a, a probe stuck up, stuck up my ass to uh, to look into hypothermia, how you how you do with hypothermia. But the, the, that sounds like you kind of make it up if you say that to the security guard. But anyway, so, but because I have, I look a bit dodgy, I seem to get these jobs of uh, being asked to speak to dodgy kids, which is quite cool. So. I give this. Uh, I was giving this talk to this to this this class, this this assembly, and I was like talking. I was talking about climbing in uh, big walls in Yosemite or wherever. And then one of the kids says, "Like, sir, do you ever wank on a big wall?" And anyway, the whole class, the whole assembly, were all like in hysterics and just like laughing, laughing, laughing. And the one of the teachers like marched along to look down the row of kids to like shout at this kid or get him out. But the teacher was laughing so much that he couldn't, he couldn't say anything. Uh, so, and then I, uh, anyway, so I got my revenge in that I, uh, this photograph came up. I said, oh, this is my, this is my girlfriend. And, uh, and everyone was like, Way, uh, they were like, put it, you know, sticking their hands up. Uh, I was like, yeah, she's dead now. And everyone just like stopped immediately. And I was like, I'm only joking. And uh, <laughs> so I, uh, and then I ended up like doing these, I started going, talking to these uh, kids in like secure, your, secure units where you'd only have like 10 kids, but you'd have like 10 assistant, you know, 10 like teaching assistants, which were like, you know, like those like, like big hoof hoofing uh, dinner lady kind of women who were there basically, you know, like as a, like a prison warden and, and all the kids were all, Kind of locked in these like in this in this i think it could i don't know if you call it a school it was like a special units for kids um and what was always interesting about that was they'd always say like don't worry if they start kicking off i like, just don't worry about it like we'll sort it out and it's nothing to do with you whatever and the, the kids never ever kicked off and i found this in a lot of schools that say like did you notice like little timmy the bastard like the one who's a who's a bastard you know, he, he didn't do it, he, like, he just listened to you really intently, like he didn't, he wasn't distracted or whatever. And I think one reason is, is that I, I speak really, really quickly. I don't, I, I find it hard to moderate how, how quickly I speak. And uh, a South African guy once said to me, people just have to listen quicker. So, um, so, and I don't know if, you know, like I said at the beginning of this, is that you, you know, you, if someone has attention deficit syndrome, you uh, you stimulate them, and that and that makes them be normal. So maybe that's the thing. I don't sound like a teacher. I'm not saying teacherly things. I'm often saying things which are are not clear, so people have to think about them. And so that was always 
that was always something I really enjoyed. Like the only, the, the, the one place I have never actually, it's when I got a spot, I've, I've done a lot of work with like the military, I've done work, you know, with, with all sorts of kinds of people. The only place I've never really, never been uh, is a prison. Um, so if there's any prison, prison people out there, not prisoners, for God's sake, uh, you're probably too busy on your Xbox anyway. Um, you know, I, I, I would, I'd be, I'd be interested to speak to, uh, speak in a prison, probably do like a concert or something. Um, so, but then the last, the last part of this, this puzzle, the Kate Patrick life in, in uh, standing on a stage is uh, motivational speaking or demotivational speaking, I, I like to call it, because it always seems a bit shy, like me standing up on the stage and, you know, talking about my life. Um, I once did a talk for one of these I don't know what a blue chip company is, but this is like one of these blue chip companies, like a, you know, you know, huge, um, anyway, a big, a big, a very big company. And I was talking at the beginning about being on the unemployed. And afterwards, someone, um, someone said, you know what, in all my years in this company, we've never had someone stand on stage and talk about being unemployed. So, and, and that's kind of weird. Like I remember doing a talk for, Barclay card and I was like how come you want me to speak to you here but you won't give me a Barclay card because I think I'm <laughs> my you know, my credit rating so low um, I think my credit rating so low because I never had a credit card so that's a, that's a good lesson in life get in loads of debt and you can have as much as you want so and uh, I did a talk once uh, and I, I lost my uh, I had some sort of, sort of insurance health insurance life insurance and after the slideshow uh, my insurance was cancelled, um, so it's a, so it is kind of weird that really, and I think I really, I'm kind of, I don't really think motivational speaking to businesses is actually any good at all. It's just uh, like someone said, if you go to a conference, it's either a holiday camp or a prison camp, and you know having me there to to give a talk, it makes it more like a holiday camp because it's kind of funny and and whatever. But the, the actual value to the to the the company is is um, companies. They actually, <laughs> I shouldn't say this. Seeing as I, you know, used to own a business that, that still makes a living, like getting people to do motivational speaking. I think the way to do, the way to do it is to actually n- not employ someone, but have someone who is involved in the in the business. As in, is says like for one year, I'm going to come. And I'm going to talk to the staff, and I'm going to be in, engaged with this, you know, on this. So if you're talking about risk, you know, dealing with risk or something, instead of like doing like 30 minutes on risk to a load of, you know, people like I did, a t- I did like a lot of work for Siemens um, on risk. You know, you, you've got like you know, 40 minutes talking to like 40 people, uh, you know, 40 different people like several times, is. Maybe you get, maybe you're gonna get some tiny little bit of, you know, like being about paranoid about everything, and, and not, you know, maybe maybe something is gonna get in there, but but you really need to uh, kind of be more embedded with, with you know, to try and change the culture. It sounds like a proper business person there. The culture, it's all about culture. So so yeah, so the the motivational speaking thing is kind of interesting, but really it is a bit of a. Like when you run a when you run a business doing this, and you know the people who do it, you know some people do really well. Uh, but you, it's kind of you'll see like a speaker bureau, and they'll have a thousand people like on their books. But really, all their income comes from like five people. So it's a very the the, the, the whole speaking, the whole sort of speaking business is, is just it's kind of a clo- it's a closed shop really. So if you want to make a living, talking then I would suggest you uh, just, it's just like being a, a stand-up comedian. And, I, and people often say to me, oh, have you ever thought of being, being a stand-up comedian? And uh, I, I'm told that I, I'm actually funnier than a comedian. Like people have come to my shows and they say, oh, this is fun. Yeah, I laugh more at this than, it's like, you know, Mark Kermod says like a com- comedy is where you laugh five times. So, you know, people find it really, really funny and it's funnier than a comedian. So they say, why don't you become a comedian? I'm like, well, are you laughing? Therefore it's comedy. But like in terms of being a comedian is, is that I would be, I would view, I would view as a very successful comedian who's not been on the television. So most comedians you meet, they're doing 
you know, gigs where there's like 50 people and they're getting like 50 quid or 100 quid, where I'm doing gigs where there's like, you know, 500, 600 people. And, you know, the last tour I did, uh, I, it was, you know, I was, I was like 35 theatres, like you almost kill me, but you're just, you're just touring, 35 theatres, doing your thing. So unless you're going to be, unless you're on the telly, unless, I, unless I'm, if you're a comedian, unless you're on the telly, on some, uh, I remember like when I, when I climbed with that woman, Alex Jones, not the conspiracy, not the conspiracy guy. Uh, she remember, she remember saying to me like, "Oh, you'd be so good on a on a on a panel show." And I was like, "Christ Almighty, is that is that is that all good for us being on a fucking panel show?" So, so, so but in terms of in terms of fame and fortune, unless I become Bear Grylls. Um, I'll actually tell you the story of meeting Bear Grylls on one of these podcasts, but unless I come Bear Grylls or Ray Mears or something, then uh, basically this is as far as I'm this is as far as I'm ever going to go, but which is which is which is totally fine. So, so I think that's probably it. I'll probably uh, I'll probably do, do another podcast more about the the technical side of uh, of putting together a talk, but I like give you I would definitely recommend anyone if you ever get the opportunity to stand up and speak to people is, you know, watch your, don't watch any of my things. A lot of my things on YouTube. But we just have to remember that there are, you know, the, the last two tours I did are on YouTube. And every time you do a tour, it's better than the one before. So I look, I look back at some of my, my original ones, which are, you know, like a long time, you know, 15 years old. And you're like, oh my God, like, why the fuck was I saying that? And why, why have I got a t-shirt with loads of fucking curry all over it? Do you know what I mean? Like you look back and you're like, oh God. I remember they did like this TED talk, TEDx, which is not a TED talk at all. And, um, and you know, I didn't, do, I didn't even prepare it. I just turned up and thought I'd do like, you know, like a half an hour slide, slideshow in 15 minutes. I just talked twice as fast as I do normally, which is like really, really fast. And you, know, you look on YouTube and it's like, slow the fuck down in the comments. So. Um, but they, 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 like life is full of stuff like that. Like you, you, I, I often look back and just think of all the stuff I've just, all the opportunities I completely blew or wasted or whatever. So, but that's su- such is life, you know. You live it, you basically live it backwards anyway. So, I shall. Uh, hopefully, I didn't say mm and air uh, too much in this. And this is actually the third time I've recorded this. Because the first time I recorded it and didn't press record, and the second time I recorded it, I just said "m" too much because I didn't know what I was going to say. So hopefully, third time's the third time's a trick. Um, if you enjoy this, if you enjoy this podcast, then um, share it, give us some comments, give me something to talk about next time, and I'll try and post them like every uh, every Friday. And uh, oh, is that? Is that? It's like a cock crowing. That's actually just a sound effect to put on to make it sound really exotic. I'm actually in Barnsley at the moment in a, in a travel lodge. So anyway, thank you for listening.